exactly there is a mammoth work he is undertaken on uh, Vridha Gargiya, uh, uh, text which is an ancient text on uh, astronomy again. So, uh, a person with a varied uh, interest, uh, he has been, uh, he, has, he is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering, New Delhi, fellow of National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, uh, member of Asia Pacific Academy of Materials, member of European Academy of Sciences. I mean, I, I mean, there's a very long list. I am not going to go through the entire list and waste uh, time just to tell you uh, he is also has been an Alexander Van Humboldt uh, Fellowship, uh, uh, Senior Fellowship, 78 to 80, 1992 and 1997. He has uh, visited several universities and uh, spent time there. Uh, so it's a very, a very uh, uh, versatile set of ideas, but uh, the interest that attracted me to the most uh, towards uh, Dr. Iyengar is uh, his work on uh, ancient Indian uh, uh, texts, uh, which I personally know it uh, requires uh, not just uh, uh, Sanskrit knowledge, but it needs enormous uh, passion, a skill to be able to interpret some of these texts and bring it in a way which makes uh, eminent sense in a contemporary world. So when I uh, contacted him, uh, uh, he readily agreed. I must thank Professor Iyengar for his uh, readiness. He's, of course, a very busy person uh, doing a lot of things. It was his kindness that he immediately agreed uh, when I requested him to come here. Just to give a little background to Professor Iyengar, here is a group of about 70, 75 students. Uh, most of them are from the two-year uh, MBA program that we have. Of course, we have some from the one-year MBA program also. We have an executive MBA, which is one year. So uh, any elective in uh, IAM Bangalore is open to everyone. So that's the kind of group. Here, is, this is a very self-selected group because Indian knowledge system is only out of interest that you have to come. So I can assure you, we have a set of people who have a lot of interest in uh, what... Uh, is the subject matter that we are going to discuss. I think with these few words, I will uh, turn uh, over to uh, Professor Iyengar. Uh, I suggest maybe, uh, sir, your lecture can be for an hour, hour, 10 minutes, whichever way you feel is uh, appropriate. I would request students to interact through the lecture. Of course, let us have a QA also at the end. But uh, should you uh, require some clarification you want to discuss, please feel free. Professor Iyengar would be happy to interact with you. Being a veteran teacher for 40, 45 years, I'm sure he would love uh, interactions. So please feel free. With these few words, uh, let me request uh, Professor Ayanga to take over. Thank you, Professor Mahadevan, for your generous introduction. Also, I should say that I'm happy to come here to talk to students after a very long time. Students mean real students, you know, young students. I've been giving talks about IKS. They're attended mostly by general people, public and elderly persons. But to see a younger group after my stint at the Indian Institute of Science, it's always a happy feeling to express. <laughs> um, Mahadevan suggested the topic called Indian Astronomical Tradition and its Contemporary Relevance. I changed it instead of Indian, I made it Vedic. Instead of Contemporary Relevance, I made it Importance. Doesn't make much of a difference. But um, the word Vedic is, uh, I will explain why I did this change and how I look at this astronomical tradition. Um, as astronomy, all of you would be having some feeling, I'm sure, about it. I hope this is visible or you want to dim the light? Uh, no, this is fine. Okay, fine. Is that fine? Yeah. It's okay. Astronomy has to do normally with, say, sun, moon, planets, stars, maybe comets. These are the popular feeling that we have about astronomy. Of course, astrophysics and modern topics will keep it outside. And you can see that in our country for the last several thousand years, I will show you 
nearly 5,000 years, actually. People have been wondering about this kind of astronomy and that astronomy has entered into our, so to say, DNA or day-to-day -day life, culture. How, why it happened like that? I want to give you a brief, you can say a cross-section of my thoughts with some evidences, with some information from our ancient texts, some of which you may be knowing of. You know that, that when we talk of tradition, tradition comes from the past. How was our past? It was by essentially a oral tradition. If we talk of the Vedic tradition, it was a oral tradition. So people transmitted knowledge orally, generation to generation to generation to generation. That is how it happened. I will show you what is our present situation on this also. Now, this, as far as scientific subjects or what you would call the phenomenal world is concerned. I'm not going into the mystical world or the philosophy or such kinds of issues, the mysticism and meaning of life and things like that, which are also in the tradition only, in the oral tradition. There are three basic things invariably everywhere you would observe. Those three in Sanskrit would be called Dyauha, Prithvi and Antariksha. Dyauha refers to the sky or the vault, whatever you are going to see. That's what I am put as astral. Then Antarikshim is the atmosphere. Where is it? the atmosphere? It is between Dyauha and Prithvi. Prithvi is the earth. Now, Prithvi and Bhumi, the concepts have changed over thousands of years. We will not be able to go into that. Whether it was a flat earth model, whether it was the globe itself, they knew what was it and those things are different. But the astronomical tradition which has come to us is in these three groups. All the three are interconnected and it is a tripartite understanding of the visible universe. That's what I would say. And if you take the Dyauha or the world, it includes cosmology, cosmogony, then astronomy, stars, uh, Dhruva, sun, moon, so on and so forth. Take the Antarikshama or the atmosphere, it is going to be about wind, clouds, monsoon, rainfall, rainbow, halos, lightning. All these things are discussed, all these things are present in our ancient texts. Now, if you come to the Prithvi, almost anything you can imagine, including Arthashastra, governance, and earthquakes, life, language, agriculture, oceans, all of them are also discussed in some manner. This may not be in the manner that we do it today, but these subjects are all covered. When my interest started with earthquakes, because I was basically I'm an earthquake engineer and engineering seismologist. So to understand the history of earthquakes in India, I had to look back up to the ancient text. Then I found that there is a whole a knowledge base which is there. It is like a vault in a temple which has not been opened. So I thought I would open it to some extent and see what is inside. You know. So I want to share that experience with you. Now, if you have to see the current relevance for the ancient tradition, we have to have a timeline. This is not a proper timeline, but this is only a caricature of a timeline. So we have the um, oral Vedic learning, when we don't know, but it has been there for a very long time, let us say before 1500 BC. And from 1500 BC onwards, some changes started occurring in our tradition. The Vedanga started coming. Vedangas, I will not go into the details. I'm sure in the IKS course, these have been covered. New subjects started coming in because they wanted to interpret these three, you know, the tripartite understanding which I mentioned previously in terms of what they see currently. So it is not just the, the oral tradition continued. They wanted to explain it to more people or in the schools also. So it separated out as a bifurcation here. This went on increasing, increasing knowledge went on increasing. The system went on increasing. Uh, that is why I have shown an increasing graph. But there are three lines I have shown. It is not just the Vedic. 
This is the way that from here onwards, you can see about 500 BC onwards, the Jaina and the Buddhist knowledge tradition also got intertwined, got intermingled with this. And this went on like this. And you would see here, 1300 is what I have shown, 1300 CE, that is about 700 years back, it increased, maybe there was a peak, and then, you know, downward trend started happening. That downward trend combined with Nalanda, Vikramashila, they were destroyed, you know, the universities. The, uh, the main organized learning system in this country, so I would say, uh, a system which was there, a large scale system, and then it went down, and we are already coming to 2000 CE, that is the present situation. So the present situation is going to be the modern university system. That's all what I can say. I don't want to say anything more on that. Now, what is this red and this line, which is slightly like this? This is the Vedic oral tradition, which is more or less continuing in the same way, even to this day. By a small group of people, they have kept up the oral tradition intact. May not be in the same way what happened in the during Harsha's time or Chanakya's time, but something is continuing. And this oral tradition is the intangible tra tradition recognized as the world heritage by the UNESCO. Now, why it was done and all that is a separate matter. The tangible educational heritage of India, the other one is the building. UNESCO, uh, the ruins in Nalanda, Mahavihara, that is recognized as the tangible educational heritage in India. These are the two. One is the intangible, the other is the tangible. Now the question comes up. This very choral tradition works here. And from here onwards, all this has grown up. Some knowledge has started coming up. Now how do we bring it up to the modern system and then try to introduce something here? Well, that is the problem of IKS. That is the problem of NEP. We need not worry about that. But my attention today is going to be this. The Vedic astronomical tradition has been here in this period before 1500. It was oral. Then the Siddhantic astronomy, uh, what we call the mathematical astronomy in India, which is very famous, started with Aryabhata around 500 AD. Now, in between, what has happened? In between these two, how is this Vedic astronomical tradition connected with the Siddhanti? If you see that there are all kinds of things are there, all kinds of theories and hypotheses are mentioned, none of them would fit in. For example, um, you have in uh, modern astronomy, in our day-to-day -day life, weekdays, the Sunday, Monday, Somwara, Banwara kind of thing. That was not there during the Vedic period at all. And Aryabhata says the, there is a Thursday in the 3101 uh, BC when the Kali Yuga started and all that. In the, no such concept in the Vedic things at all. There's no Vara there. There are so many other things. I'm not going to those, but what is it still which binds us with that? There's still something is a very strong uh, link which is there. That is what I want to bring out today in the next few I mean, few minutes, maybe about an hour's time. So the field of IKS is too deep and wide. How do we handle it? Now, as an engineer, as a scientist, I would handle many things in terms of data. That is, data is given, and the data I want to analyze and see what can happen about it. Now, the data in IKS, even if you see the Vedic things, is going to be in terms of anecdotes, legends about celestial bodies. This is the astronomical thing. This is the astral, as that is what the word I use. And this, we have to bring it into a modern notation so that we can understand it properly. Now, there are key issues there. The location is the sky. And hence, it has to be astronomical. If it makes sense today in our context, we have had some understanding. That's all what you can say. Yeah what they felt, how they felt, what was their reason. 5,000 years back, I can't go back and see that. I can only understand it in a modern sense and then verify it. Because there are key things which have remained same. It's the same sun, same moon, the same stars. 
and the numbers, the same numbers. See, the one, two, three, four, or Ekam, the way, three, they have not changed. And the Sahasra, Shata, the same words were using. So they also had the same words. So those numbers, do they make meaning today in this context is what we can verify. And if it does, then we have to accept it as part of our intellectual tradition or intellectual history. That is the idea here. Now, ancient, uh, how do we go about this? What is the methodology? It is only through textuals. The evidence is, even though there is a oral tradition, you can go and verify with them whether this text, today when you see the mantra, is it in the same way or in a different way? This is a very hard task, but there are a few people who can do it. We did it in field also to some extent, can't go into that. The ancient Vedic and other texts, when you say other texts, it is all before common era. Before common era means you can roughly say Chanakya and before him, Kautilya and before him is the common era is the zero. Then before that is the common, the before the common era. There are at least about 200 plus texts which are available, many of them in printed form, some of them translated, some of them uh, just in manuscript form, which has to be edited. And this is a large amount of information which is available. But the, this contains the astronomical information. But the way today, if, if somebody writes a book on astronomy, he will do it in a systematic way because he has some background, the physics background, Newton's law, celestial mechanics, a variety of things. But in those days, their perception was different. Their perception was always Prithvi Mata Jauhu Pita. Sky is my father, Prithvi is my mother. So always it was a universal concept they had. They would always try to link these things, the whatever they were seeing in the sky with the earth and also in between the Antariksha. So the astronomy or any subject for that matter is need not be astronomy, even in mathematics or music or maybe philosophy. They always combined all these things. All the three which I showed, they all got combined. So if you are interested in astronomy today, you have to pick up those things and then unknot them, decipher them and see what is the kind of thing which is happening. I will, instead of being general, I will show some examples. I think that may be the best way of introducing the subject. Now, some of these, they need verification by large scale computer simulation. If you have to verify it, I'll give you one example also. Of that. Now, there is considerable amount of mathematical concepts and principles. In, is widely present in chandas, music, vastu, shilpa, fine arts, in dance, in place where you don't expect. See, today, you know, fine arts and science, they are separated out, disjointed in our universities. Music is different. Physics is different. But music is, is the physics of sound. So if sound somebody study, studies as a scientific subject, music also can be studied like that. Western universities, they have recognized this, they are doing it. Unfortunately, in our universities, there is a compartmentalization between arts and science. And this was all based on mathematical concepts, their theories. I will not go into that. The tradition explains mathematics of raga verbally and metalinguistically. Now, computers are a big help in the analysis of such sound patterns. This I will not do, even though we are working on this. I will have three, if time permits three, otherwise only two examples. To illustrate the astronomical tradition, Instead of being theoretical, I'm becoming practical. Ask the question, when did Dhruva become the fixed pole star? Now, Dhruva story, all of you know, right? Somebody doesn't know, raise your hand. Everybody knows, okay. So, he was the son of, uh, you know, Uttanapada, a king, and Suniti was his uh, mother. Suruchi was his stepmother and there was some problem and all that it comes up in all the legends and in the Puranas and also the people who do in the evening lectures and evening pravachan you know they also talk about Dhruva's bhakti yes. and how he did penance in the forest with Narada gave a mantra and then you know, he got a boon from Vishnu the boon was that you become the fixed pole star in the north 
And not only that, your mother will also be with you, time immemorial along with you in the sky. That is the story which is there, the gist of this story. So when did this happen? Second one, there is a Vedic text which I will show you as you go through. And there is a link with the Brahmanda Purana. Now, Puranas also form a large set of IKS texts, and there is a link between them. The third one, in the Vridhagargi Jyotisha, which Dr. Mahadevan has mentioned that I'm editing right now. If there is time, I will touch on this seasonal nakshatras, otherwise no. Now, you see, we have to understand one important information about when we observe or when we feel or when you talk about time, history, and all of that. That is, Earth, as we know today, you have three kinds of motion. The diurnal motion, daily it rotates, let's say 24 hours. Then there is an annual motion around the sun, 365 days or 366 days. There is one more, that is the precision. The precision is, if I can run this, let me see. I think. Yeah. You see, this is Earth. This is the North Axis. See, Earth and Sun, they call the ecliptic, they're slightly inclined. And that is the figure also I have shown here outside. And as this changes, so these are the, okay, it went out. <laughs> You have to see the north always, and slowly this north point describes a circle. And that circle is what is called the polar circle. And you can see this cursor, it moved from here. It takes 26,000 years to come to the same star. Yeah, it comes in space, stops here. So that is the Dhruva. That is the pole star. In English, it is called Polaris or Alpha Ursa Minor, if you want the scientific word for that. Now, 26,000 years, this is the circle which has been marked. So we have one day, the smallest one, time. Second one, one year or 366 days. Third one, some 26,000 years. Now, if we claim that we have a long history, one of the very verifiable or one of the important issues is not going to be what is the date of Mahabharata, Ramayana, this and that, and all kinds of jumble. One can do that. I have no objection on that. But do the text, they stand the test of fiction. Or is it something the text do not know about it, so do not talk about Dhruva at all. Many of the texts in other cultures, you see, they don't talk about it. Because you would see a very important information here. As this changes, I hope you are able to see the things. This is the pole point. If you want to take a child to, the, to show the Dhruva after hearing this story, Go to the planetarium and show this is the Dhruva. Which is that Dhruva? That is going to be this Polaris or Alpha Ursa Minor. This is the present day thing is what we are going to show. Now, modern astronomy, as per that circle you saw, there were only two things. One was the first one which showed it came back to the same one after 26,000 years. In between, there are about 5,000 years of gap on that circle. I will show that circle once again later in greater detail. So the intriguing point is going to be the following. The story of Dhruva, as it is, we know. This is from the Puranas. Vishnu Purana, Brahmanda Purana, and a few other Puranas. Not all the Puranas, but some of these older Puranas. And historically, it is known, these Puranas, which are in Sanskrit, they were scripted during the Gupta period. 
Gupta period is around, let us say, 300 AD or 200 AD or 400. And that is the story that is being carried on by our grandfathers, my grandmothers and our mothers and told the ch child about the Dhruva story. And during that 400 AD, there was no pole star. <coughs> Modern astronomy clearly shows this is the present day pole star and the previous pole star is here. Is called Thuban or Alpha Draconis, which was the pole star during 3000 BC. I will show the figures once again later. Now, in between, there was no pole star, there was no star on that circle. Only if there is a star on that circle, people can see that it remains stationary. What is meant by stationary? You can see here. If you can see clearly, this is like you put a plane here, something like a flat piece, hit a nail on the top. That is the here. And this one, there are seven stars, they rotate. They rotate how? Daily in the night. In the night, if you see, this would will not move. Even today, you can see that. Whereas these stars which are here, they change their position from evening to morning. In the, um, after the sunlight, you can't see them. And you surmise that they have circled and come back to the original position once again with this being fixed. All this you can read in Siddhantic astronomy, Brahmagupta's text, and also in Bhaskaracharya's text and all that. They How they measure time in the night using this. But that was in the 7th century, 8th century, and 12th century. I'm talking of the 400 AD, the 4th century, when there was no pole star. So this became the pole star only from slowly coming near the pole, only from about 800 or so, 800 AD or so. Even today, it is not exactly at the pole. It is about 10 minutes away from the pole, but you can't make out the difference. Up to one degree, the eye will not recognize it. In naked eye observation, you take it as fixed. Even 100 years back, it was taken as fixed. Now, this becomes a, con a kind of a paradoxical thing. How did our ancients know about it? Was it a memory they had? Or somebody transmitted this information? Our Puranas were also some kinds of legends which were orally carried and written down during the Gupta period. That's a possibility. So this will have to be investigated. And the another very interesting thing which happens is the following. There is one constellation shown here as Draco below this. Today also you can see this in the planetarium. Draco means dragon. It looks like a serpent. And this is explained in Brahmanda Purana very precisely. Says the Dhruva is at the tip of an animal called Shishumara. And that Shishumara has 14 stars, and their shape is given, the names are given, the body parts are given. Uh, don't want, I, I hope some of you have no objection to reading Sanskrit, right? A little bit is read. Okay. Sakara Shishumara Sche Vigneha Pravibhagasaha. He orders that you should know this animal by its body parts. And that is. Uttana Padas Tasyata Vigneyo Uttara Hanu. The head is going to be called Uttana Pada. Then the lower jaw is called Yajna and so blah blah all of this. Then Pucha Agnishya Mahendrascha Maricha Kashyapa Dhruvara. So in the tail of this animal, you recognize four stars. And the last one being called Dhruva. That's the fixed star. And he also says this. Taraka Shishumarasya Nastam Yanti Chatushayam. These four, they don't set. So the stars setting and rising means, normally we see Rohini, Kritika, they all set and rise. But near the pole, if they are very near the pole, they don't set and rise. They would always be visible all through the year. If you know where to see them, you can see them. And these four stars were not setting is what he says. 
And this is already in 400 AD if you take this as it is. But this is actually a memory because they did not know this. How do we know this is a memory? This goes back to the Vedic period. That's the only way. Or it could have been imported from other countries where they don't have this at all. So we have to investigate this a little bit further. And there are some commentaries on some of these texts, not all. Vishnu Purana, there is a commentary. And he says it is Shruti. Sridhari Vyakyana says it is as per the Shruti, this is what has been said. That is called Shishu Mala. Now, I'm not going to other issues, but a very important fallout of this is the concept of Meru. Meru you might have heard. That was an imaginary kind of a pole, sometimes called a mountain, which connects Earth to Dhruva. That is to the pole star. Because these two are fixed there. Earth is supposed to be fixed. Pole star is fixed. They imagine that there is going to be a vertical pole. That pole is called Meru, Methi, Medi. They are some of the different parts. And an imaginary, imaginary cosmology, cosmogony, all of that developed out of that. So if you see the Puranic cosmology of the uh, Brahmanda Purana, it is the cosmology which has been like this. It's all modeled after what we would say, what, what is seen in the world, day-to-day -day life, in terms of that you try to understand even the larger universe. The same principle even today scientists do. There is no other way. And two of the models are given here. One is, is the Kulala Chakra, is the Potter's wheel. What he says is, see, this may be rotating, but the center point is fixed. So Dhruva is like that. So Dhruva is, is center. It is needed. Otherwise, the circle won't go. But sun, moon, and all of them, they are going around Dhruva. This sort of becomes slowly philosophical issues. But that is how the philosophy has developed. They were not satisfied with this model. They developed another model. It is the oil mill model. So in the oil mill model, you can see it is the bullocks which run the mill. But there is a vertical pole here, and this point doesn't actually move. If you see that it's supposed to be fixed, except for errors, it will be a single point. So he says the motive force for this is coming from here. And there are statements there. Dhruva is himself rotating, like a um, what you may call a gear mechanism. And he controls and rotates sun, moon, and others. That means these bullocks are rotated from here, not the other way around. So these are some of the concepts which develop. And they give a number, the time, and they try to see what they are observing is matching with these things or not. Now, of course, all this became redundant later on, and we have a new thing. And why it happened, how it happened is not known. That discontinuity has to be investigated. Maybe some of you may take it up and as an interest in several. But my first question is the following. From where did the Puranas get this information? He doesn't say anything. But Puranas in the beginning itself says everything is from the Vedas. Whatever is the said in the Purana, it is from the Vedas. It's a broad statement. If you see, go through it, you would see that it's not totally true. It is not totally untrue also. There's quite a bit. And among the Puranas, the 18 Puranas, the nearest to the Vedas is the Brahmanda Purana. So the Brahmanda Purana gives many of the Vedic things, the numbers, in the same way. Um, I have verified some of these, but the important thing is this. There is a Vedic mantra in the Yajur Veda, which describes Dhruva, which describes Shishumar. So from here only, the Puranas would have got the information about Shishumara and the Dhruva and the 14 stars. What is that? That is called Taitiriya Aranyakam. Taitiriya Aranyakam is a very famous subject, uh, text. It is repeated in Bangalore, in all over South India, and many of the temples, many of the days. You can be beautiful to listen and all that. If you can understand the meaning, you will feel more satisfied with the culture, what it has. The first part of the Taitiya Arandakam is about seasons. It is called Aruna Ketukam. 
and Arunaketikam is used for so many other purposes by the priests. I will not go into that. But it discusses how the six seasons can be identified. So the se season determination in the most ancient time was by feeling. It was a kind of social recognition. Whether it is cold or this, or what happens in the sky. There are two important things which gives with reference to sky. They knew that it is the sun which changes the season. But how do you fix up the six seasons? It says in the Grishma, there is going to be a Rudra Gana which comes. That is actually a meteoritic shower. And similarly, in the Hemanta season, that is six months away, it says there is going to be another Marut Gana which comes. That is another meteoritic shower. Not going to that. That is again astronomy. That astronomy of the Maruts, of the Marut Ganas or the meteoritic showers and the comets goes back to the Rigveda. But this is later on that. It gives the seasons. And it also says, Rishayaha Sapta Trishtayatna Sarve Atriva Agastya Akshatre Shankruto Avasam The Sapta Rishis and Agastya are staying with the nakshatras. They themselves are not the nakshatras, it doesn't say, it is there. But for astronomical purposes, these became the names. So the Ursa measure the seven stars are called subjects even today. Many times called seven sages. And their names are also available, even though Varahamhira gives different set of names, Puranas given differently, Vedas give differently. See, Atri, Brugu, Kutsa, Vasishta, Gautama, Kashipa, Angirasa, they are the seven. Which some of you may know, you would be repeating daily in your evening prayers or Sandhya Mandanam. But you see, uh, Varaham Hire gives a different set. Let us not go into that. But Agastya, the key, Agastya is Canopus. Canopus, you can, if, if you don't know the correspondence between the modern and the old one, I am telling. Agastya is the name for the star called Canopus, who is in the south. So it is a southern star. And whole of the epics, particularly Ramayana, is about rectification of the north-south direction. Saptarsha is in the north, Agastya in the south. So and they try to relate these two. And it combines more or less in a way, not being uh, emotional or shamanistic in this, but celestially, from the north to the south, India was combined already in, by this month, I can see. It is from there to there, they are covered in the sky. And that is what, is, what they looked at as far as astronomical uh, astronomy was concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, the same text gives this also. This is supposed to be a mantra for meditation in the evening, looking at the north. North, the Dhruva Mandala, looking at the Dhruva Mandala. That is all explained in the commentaries. And traditionally, the Vedic people, the oral traditional people I showed you, there are a few groups of Brahmins who have continued this, kept up this tradition. They remember the text for 5,000 years, they remember that. And they brought it up, and it says here, Shiro Dharmo Murdanam Brahma Uttara Hanuhu Yajno Adara Vishnu Hrudayam Samvatsara Prajananam Ashwina Purva Padav kind of thing. There are 14 names and 14 body parts are explained there. And how do you know it is an animal? Divya Shakvara Shishumara. It is Divya Shakvara Shishumara. It's a celestial animal. Even everybody accepts that. Even in the Monier Williams dictionary, it is given as a part of the sky which looks like a whale or a uh, parpoise is what is the given thing there. And this is what I have marked. This is important because later on historically this mm. is a very important bearing this word Shakvara and Shishumara. Come to that. The Dhruvastvamasi, Dhruvasya Kshitimasi, Bhutanam Adipati Rasi, etc. He says you are the Dhruva and you are the controller of all the beings in the universe, and people go around you. Pariyavartate, Bhutani Upa Pariyavartante. They go around you. This mantra is important because this is the marriage mantra. And the astronomically, it comes to the marriage. And this is the cultural connection from the Jyohu to Prithvi. 
And that is how this has been remembered and maintained. Now, you see, go back to the discussion, the astronomical uh, issues, and see whether this 14 starred animal that is called the Draco in modern thing. This is a modern impression, both of them. Is there any possibility of that being a pole star? You can mathematically do it, or today you have so many facilities available to you. Yes, it was the pole star here. The 14 star was here. And you can count the stars. There are four here, bright stars. There is one more figure. You may be able to see that. And it comes here. The 14 star is here. That is actually modern astronomy calls it Alpha Draconis. And in uh, Persian, it was called Thuban. And that word Thuban went to uh, Europe and they have retained the same word Thuban. Thuban may be the yeah, upper branch of Dhruva only. That is what I want to convey to you. Now, <clears throat> so what? You may say, when was this possible? That was possible around 3000 BC. Precisely, if you see, it was 2830 BC. This is the figure which I have put up here. This is the curve. This is the, on this side is shown the declination. Declination is how far you are away from your observational position, from the equator to the pole. Where is that star located? Then on the right side, I have plotted the terrestrial latitude. Terrestrial latitude means your location. This is Kurukshetra is around 30 degrees. Ujjaini is around 25 degrees. Kanchi Paramar, even Bangalore, are around 12 degrees or so. That it. Now, for all this, if 2830 BC, BCE, this was almost 90 degrees. This star was here at 90 degrees. People would have recognized it all over India as fixed star. Okay? This is an important thing. Now, before 2830, it was not here. It was somewhere maybe 85 or something. But for about 200 to 300 years, it, they would have taken it as the Dhruva. Now, slowly when you come down with time, you see, this is 2830. The time is here. zero is the common era. 500, 2000 is our present era. Even now, if you go to in Kurukshetra and other places, it is still circumpolar. Circumpolar means somewhere in the sky, it is visible. Whereas, if you in South India, Kanchipuram, or even in Bangalore, this star, I'm not talking of the present day pole star, please remember this, is the ancient pole star that is Thuban. It won't be, even around 1000 BC, it lost its circumpolarity. That means in some season it will be visible, some season it will be rising and setting. It will be totally below the horizon, you won't be able to see. So there is a tendency for people to forget it or look for it and take some other things. But the tradition remains same. The marriage tradition of looking at the Dhruva and telling the bride, see the Dhruva, and she has to say, yes, I see the Dhruva. Now, this is a funny situation, but it leads to considerable amount of scientific information, which is important of current relevance. Now, you may say, sir, you are telling that this is fixed and later on it went on like this. Did anybody say, I'm not able to see Dhruva? <laughs> Did anybody say that Dhruva is moving or something like that because it was fixed originally? Yes, in the Maitreya Aranyaka, that is again a Vedic text. The king Brihadratha complains that I'm not able to see Dhruva. Dhruva is even Dhruva is moving. What he says is, uh, I don't know whether I have that text here. Maybe I will come back in there. So that, just to sum up, uh, this uh, slide just sums up two things. The present day pole star is here, 2000 C. This is Polaris. You can see this uh, constellation coming up here. The ancient Dhruva is here. 3000 BC and that constellation looking at the serpent, which was called Shishumara. Shishumara is a whale or a long aquatic animal. The, the, that is 
far away from the present place. So these three we have to And this has been marked as the 14 star constellation. You can count them four, five. There are two feet here because it's an aquatic animal with four uh, legs. Two here, two here. Then one, two, three, four. This is the tile. Agni, Indra, and Dhruva. And there is one small star here. Later on in a enlarged version, you can see near Dhruva, Suniti is also going to be there. So you have to question, should, why can't I take this as the one which is then in the Brahmanda Purana and also in the uh, Taitiri Aranika? And if it is so, then, you know, this belong to 3000 BC, this observation, not the present day 1000 BC or 1500 BC. So the question comes up, person who can uh, put a counter argument, did anybody say that they were unable to see that or was it moving? Yes, that is also recorded. And that is in the, uh, what I said, the Maitreini Aranika. Maitreini Aranika will not read this. As a king by name Brahadrata, he questions the sage, why Dhruvasya Prachalanam, Shoshanam, Maharnavanam, Shikarinam, Prapatanam, etc., etc. It is, he is, this is actually a Vedantic uh, concept which is coming up slowly. And he is explained to the sage, everything looks transient because what we thought has fixed up, the mountains are falling down. Earth also shakes, which is fixed. Even Dhruva is moving. So his final uh, you know, difficulty is Nirveda, what you will call, is because Dhruva is called Achyuta. That is a name for Vishnu also. But here the description Vishnu is in the Hridayam of the uh, Shishumara. We will not worry about it. But Dhruva and Achyuta are same. You, it is a contradiction in terms. You call something as Achyuta. He falls down. You call something as Dhruva, he moves. That becomes a very complicated psychological problem for the whole society. And he also says there are 13, uh, 16 kings before him. I'm not reading this. He gives the names uh, Indra, Jumna, Kovalaya, Shwa, etc., etc. 16 kings. Where are they? Where did they go? What happened to them? There is a very subtle issue here. This precision, the change of this, because it happens over 26,000 years, we say, who saw that? How do you recognize it? The, in one's lifetime, unless you are an astronomer, you will not be able to recognize it. It is only a tradition which can recognize. Tradition means generation to generation, because one degree variation takes 72 years. 360 degrees, you can divide by this and you can find out 72 years. 72 years is something like two generations are at least one generation. At least if there are a few generations, they were observing, they were telling fixed, fixed, fixed. You look there, do the uh, go to the Achyuta or to Durva, then they say it is moving. So the generation also he gives 16 generations and ask what happened to them. And all these are together. So you have to interpret it in a suitable way. And what does the Rishi Shakyana say? It is all Vedanta. He gets into Brahman, Prana, and all of this. One of the very important Aranyaka and Upanishad. The first part is Aranyaka, then it becomes Upanishad. Not going to the Upanishad. But you may ask, when was this? You might have said, when did he say this? Even in 3000 itself, did he say that? No. It's a new kind of time mapping comes up here. He says here, Magadhyam, Shravishtardam, Agneyam, Kramena, Utkramena, etc. Now, it takes more time to explain all this. How did they count time? How did they recognize time? The easy thing, 26,000 years is ruled out. Year they would have done. Day they would have done. How? Only with sun. Each day they have to count. Sunrise 1, sunrise 2, sunrise 3. So how did they do that? There has to be some fixed point from there only you can do. He says it is a Magadhyam. From the Magha Nakshatra, the days are counted. Why? What is Magha Nakshatra? It is not the moon's Nakshatra. People have mistaken this. 
that because the Westerners translated nakshatra as lunar mansion and they are visible only in the night, they mistook that for solar zodiac was not there. It is all solar zodiac. Moon comes up later on, it is important, no doubt, but in the initial stages, it is only solar. So this, I will not go into all of this. I, I can show that this belongs to 1800 BC, when the solstice, the summer solstice, started in the Magha Nakshatra. Well, what do we mean by that? We have to have some idea of how the time measurements were done. And all that. It is not time within a day. Time Measuring time within a day is more complex. I will not go into that. That also was done during the Vedic period, but I will not go into that. The simple thing is about the year. You keep on seeing, you see, there are here 27 stars. I'll call the Nakshatra Mala, which is a mark. These 27 nakshatras are made up of 83 stars. Don't be under the impression they are only 27 stars. No, I don't know. And all these had their own names so that you can identify those group of stars. Now, Kritika, it looks like a cutter. Kritika means in Sanskrit, it's a cutter. That is, you cut something with like a knife, with a big knife, it's like a butcher's knife. That is how it looks. So similarly, the Rohini is a shakata. It is like a triangular cart. The ancient carts, they were not rectangular like the bullock carts of present day. They were triangular. So it's a triangular cart. Like that it goes on. And Magha is somewhere yeah. here. Magha is, uh, yeah, this is Magha. Magha looks like an enclosure. It's called Koshtaga. Now, what the text says is, that is the same text here. And he says, Surya Yonir Vai Kalasya. Surya is the starting point of time. All time belongs only to Surya. There is no time before the birth of Surya, before the creation of Surya. And then it goes on like this, Magadhyam Shravishtadhyam. Magha is here. And what is meant by summer solstice? I have marked here. If you observe sun, if you haven't done it, please do it. If, in some season, it seems to rise in the left eye, in the summer season. In the winter season, it seems to rise in the south, right around December 21st or something like that. Whereas June 21st or something, summer solstice time, it seems to rise on the left. And the equinox is the center. Somewhere in March, it will be rising as though even here in Bangalore, you can see uh, your east center, whereas goes to right and the left. And not only that, in winter, it is at a very low level. It seems as though it is setting and rising as low. Whereas in summer, it seems to be at a high. This is an, actually a feeling that a human being gets. That's what I am writing. And in the northern hemisphere, sun always goes to the right. You can observe it. You stand there and sun, after rise, it keeps on going like this, not like that. That is why the right side is called Dakshina, and sun is supposed to do Pradakshina of Dhruva, because Dhruva is the north center, the pole. So that is the concept which developed. Once they observed, they knew that Dhruva is moving, they had to go to sun to decide Kala, to decide everything about it. And the mark of this, of the year, is here. In the summer solstice, the Magha Nakshatra, the sun rises here. Early morning, Magha has also risen. So associate sun to be with Magha Nakshatra. And then each day, you keep on observing, sun will be rising in the same Nakshatra nearly, one or two, slightly different, that's all. But after four, 13 or 14 days, a new Nakshatra rises, and sun has moved, rising point has moved. Because the sun rays, from here to here, it has to go. This is what is called Ayana. So, your Dakshinayana and the Uttarayana is this. Dakshinayana is from north to south sun goes. That means the sunrise itself happens like that. Uttarayana is from the south, sunrise happens on the other side. So, one year the circle happens. Like that. And that has been mapped here. So, if you keep on putting all these things together, after 183 days, you get Shravishtardam, half of Shravishta, that is 
Aquarius constellation. Half means there are four stars and half a fit. It is actually a count because 366 is the whole number of day, sunrises in a year. So it is actually the sunrise which has been counted here, divided by 27. So 13 and 5 by 9 days for each nakshatra is allocated. This is there in the Vedas. I'm not uh, doing a mathematics here. It is already given there. So, and this is divided into six seasons. The six seasons have shown this is the Varsha, rainy season. So from summer solstice onwards, even now it is like that. June, monsoon has to start. We keep on expecting. June 21st is the summer solstice. But if you go to the other places, rain could have started already. But it's not a very precise one, but the nakshatras are precise. Because you have no control over it, and you observe it and say, it is with this star, with this star, this star. So sun rising is the important thing, and that is how they're marked. So magadhyam is this. Now, how do I get the time for that? Now, that can be worked out putting up the summer solstice and the nakshatra position as per modern catalogs. See, equinox is considered zero degree longitude today. Equinox means the intersection of the ecliptic and the equator, celestial equator. That happens on March 21st. So if you count everything for March 21st, you can have a new one. But the calendar itself will shift. You go 200 years back, 300 years back kind of thing. So the modern astronomers, they want a fixed thing that is called the equinoctial point. That is called the zero degree longitude. Now, in the Brahmanda Purana, also something is given about the full moon <coughs> happening on the equinoctial day. Now, what is equinox? Like the Ayana was important in the Vedas. There is further progress. It is not only the Dakshinayana. Dakshinayana, I'm sorry, the summer solstice. You see, the days are very long. In summer, days are long. Nights are short. Opposite in the winter. So, on the Uttarayana start point, you can easily fix it up. When did it start? The longest night of the year. If you have, today you can do it with your clock. They did it with kind of, um, you know, a pole or the shadow. So, when it was happening and also combined with the feelings. So, you would know that the longest night was the starting point of sun going to the north. That is the Uttarayana. Don't Mix up the two. Uttarayana is not in the Uttara. It is going to Uttara, going to the north. Similarly, Dakshinayana is sun going to south. So six months he keeps on going to south. Six months he keeps on going to north. That is the Vedic interpretation. Now, the Brahmanda Purana says something more. And the equinox point, the day and night are equal. Right? That is on the March 21st, you have 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. Or in terms of muhurta, it will be equal 15 muhurtas of this or 15 more. That's what it says. So you can locate by time, also putting a shanku or a, a pole, you can know this, whether it is equal. It gives some more information. It says if the spring equinox, that is in the Vasantarutu equinox. Sun is in the equinox. Moon is in the Vishakha nakshatra. And it is a full moon. Similarly, when sun is in Vishakha, three-fourths, that, that is the equinoctial point, there is a full moon in Kritika. It won't happen every year. But it has made some observation. And it says, this is the starting point you can have to make measurement of time in the night for moon. How much moon moves and what are those things? For that, he says, starts with the full moon. It is, all, it is very interesting, very obvious. Because Mama say you don't, can't see anything. The later mathematical people might have taken Mama as a better value for some other purposes. But full moon is observational and you can take it as a 
And if this is true, actually, here in this circle, this is the Magha here and Shravishta half here, first day to 183rd day. And here it is the 92nd day, which will be the equinoctial day. And here the 273rd day, which is the equinoctial day. Because 366 is divided by 1 4, that's all, nothing more. The Brahmanda Purana says there are full moon here, there is a full moon here. So when sun was here, full moon happened here. Sun was here, full moon happened here. But this is Kritika and Vishaka, they are observable stars. Like the other stars, Kritika, as I already showed you, even today you can see Kritika very well. Vishaka is on the other side, it splits. But no, Kritika and Vishaka are not at 180 degrees away. They are not at 100, they are 165 degrees away. So it gives one fourth of Kritika and three fourths of Vishaka is what the Purana says. So what we have done is yeah, amenable for archaeology. Simulate all the full moons for the last 5,000 years. They actually done it for 3,000 years. Start from minus 2,400. All the full moons you take, count the full moons which are near the equinox. Every year there will be 12 to 13 full moons. You generate them. How do you do that? There are mathematical formulas available in MEU's table and others. And you can program them easily. You need some effort. That's all what is needed. And I can plot all the full moons in the spring equinox. I'm sorry. This equinox, uh, when the sun is here, the Kritika at the, around the zero degrees, what is happening here. Similarly, in the other side also, the full moons are marked. Now, where are the nakshatras? The actual visible nakshatra, Kritika, due to this precision, which I showed in the first one, in not only the pole stars, even the equinoxes, those stars are also their shift. One degree per 72 years. The, so their longitude, their position keeps on shifting. And based on that, I can mark Kritika like this. Starting from where the longitude was and what is the longitude keeps on changing with time. Similarly, Vishaka is also marked. Now it is like solving a simultaneous equation. The two have to match. Where do they match? They match in this region. It's not a precise equation, but it's a region I get. You want you can do it through simplex programming or whatever, but I'm not making it complicated. It's rather simple. And this is the time which has been marked, which is about uh, minus uh, 2000, that is 2000 BC to 1600 BC. A 400 year period in which this is valid. Both the Maitrayaniya statement was valid as well as the Purana statement was valid. Take an average, so 1800 is a reasonable period. Say that what uh, you know, Brahadrata said his Nirveda that everything is moving, Druha is moving. He wanted development of Upanishads and development of Vedanta. It started from the 1800 BC, minimum from there. And this Brahmanda Purana carries this memory. Brahmanda Purana, as I said, it was written in 400 AD, but it has these shlokas. You can go and read these locus, like the Durva also, it is there. So there was definitely a culture of this in our country. And in the next, maybe in 10 minutes, I want to finish this. Okay. I want to take you back to Dhruva because all started with the Dhruva sprung. Maybe as a memory, they kept up the mantra of the original 3000 mantra, Dhruva Kshitihi, Dhruva Yonihi, Dhruva Masi, Dhruva Tastikam, this is the mantra in the Dhruva Darshanam. In all Hindu marriages, supposed to be in the night, after the sunset, when the stars rise, the husband and wife, they are supposed to see the Dhruva. Actually, the husband has to show Dhruva to his wife, to the bride. And the meaning, there is other mantras, is not just this much further. It is actually an empowering mantra. However, the modernist may take it. Says, 
you be in this house like Dhruva. Dhruva is centered like the universe. All others go around Dhruva. People in my household will go around you. What more do you want for a newly married bride? So she is promised that much, or is an empowerment for her, is a motivation for her to be in the family, and that is the mantra to be said. But you, you ask, which star they saw? This was the original mantra. Originally, they were doing it. I'm sure about it. But slowly, when the Dhruva went on changing, changing, and when it was circumpolar, they were still able to locate that Dhruva. That Dhruva was not fixed in the night. Nevertheless, the same mantra was said. Because this is culture. In culture, traditionally religion, whatever is the oldest one, it continues like that. So the same mantra was used there. But if you read the text, around 500 BC, this was all codified. The marriage mantras, the Upanayan mantras, the Guru Pravesha mantras. You want to go to some other place, you want to start a new work. What was the mantra to be said? How it has to be the Havana, Homa, all of that around 500 BC. It's not a single book. There are at least about eight books which are available called the Grihya Sutras. This Grihya Sutra is the one which complicated some amount of misunderstanding on the Aryan invasion theories. You see, there is a long link for that. Towards the end, I will come to that. These Grihya Sutras were around 500 BC. Everybody agrees. It is not Vedic. Very clear the way it is. And what it says, one of that I am reading. Astamite Dhruvam Darshayati. Very simple. When the sun is set, you have to show that. All that, all that. Then, Sa Yadina Pashyat. Pashyamiteva Bhruya. Suppose the lady could not see the star. She has to say I have seen. It is become like telling I do. You have to say that because that becomes a formality because it became codified. See, these marriage things became codified, it became something like a law or it has to be valid in the eye of the society. It has to be done like that. And this has gone to such an extent, you would see Kalidasa, famous poet, Kumar Sambhavan, he makes Parvati look at the Dhruva. <laughs> Kalidasa lived in 5th century. And this is a very beautiful shloka. I can't help reading. Dhruvena Bhartra Dhruva Darshanaya Prayujyamana Priya Darshanena Sa Drishtait Anana Mundamaya Hrisanna Kanti Kathama Pivacha. So Shiva asked Dhruva Darshanam, you have to see. She says, somehow I've seen, because she lifts her head. Kathama Pivacha, whether she saw it or not, is different. But anyway, Dhruvena Bhartra, Kalidasa covers it. Her husband it himself is Dhruva. So either way you can interpret it. That is different. But you know, Kalidasa immortalized this tradition. That the <coughs> Dhruva Darshanam tradition was immortalized by ordinary common people, poets, common people. They were doing it. And not only he, in 7th century, Maga has written a Mahakavya called Shishupalavada. He looks at the early morning sky. Well, not, he was in a place called Jalor in Rajasthan. Uh, early morning, five o'clock sky I have plotted here. If you see that, this point is the pole point. There is no star here. It is only indicated there is the central point. The present day pole star is here. This is the this is 700 CE, that is AD. And the Vedic pole star is here. This is the Tuban, or what you may call it. No star was here. But he still says, Sputatarma Uparishtat, etc. What he wants to say is, this Dhruva is Krishna himself, is Achyuta. He has hit the Shakata. Shakata, you know the story of Krishna. He hits the cart, Shakata Banjana. And those demons, you know, they fall on. He says the Shakata here is of the Saptarshis. The Saptarshi is called the, also Shakata. He's, Shakata is as though he is kicking it. So the Saptarshis are going down. It is actually a physical picture. When you see the sky, it seems as though the Ursa Major is going down. Whereas Dhruva, this 
is going up like this, that tile is lifting up like that. So this became so intense, except there was some kind of dark point. That dark point is helpful to our history. That dark point is by Al-Baruni. Al-Baruni, you know, along with uh, Kilji, attacked so Somanath and all those kids and historical things, not going to those kinds. But Al-Baruni was very much interested in Indian traditions, Indian knowledge. He had very good knowledge of Brahmagupta, Varahamira, and some about the Puranas also. You can read in his book, India. should be available even online. It is available. He says, devout Hindus whom he knew held that the North Pole star was in the constellation that looks like a four-footed aquatic animal called Shakwara and also Shishumar. This word Shakwara is a Vedic word from the Taiti Aranyaka. Later on, it is not used there. And he knew that. He further says that this name sounds similar to the Persian Susmar, which is the constellation of the lizard. This Draco was called by the Persians lizard because it looks like a lizard. The animal looks like a lizard. It was called a lizard in the medieval period. Later on, it became Draco or dragon. Same as the modern Draco. He further adds that the Hindus tell ludicrous tales about this figure. It is the comment he makes, a superstition, this, that, all kinds of things. By this, he alludes to the Puranas. The Vishnu Purana is what he is alluding. He calls it Vishnu Dharma, but it is Vishnu. That praise the people with correct knowledge of the 14 stars, making up the constellation to be blessed with an extra 14 years of life. I read one shloka in the Brahmanda Purana. It says you have to know everything correctly. Then your life will exceed. You have 14 years of life for this. Because there are 14 the numbers. See, this is what I meant. From the Vedic period, the numbers are important. So if these numbers can be matching, you get you can go nearer the truth. So Al-Baruni had all this. Okay, I will skip this. But this clearly says... That even in 11th century, about 1,000 years back, people were believing their pole star was only in Shishun. That is in the Vedic one. Um, obviously, it's a conflict. What did our Siddhantic astronomers do? The mathematical astronomy had started already with Aryabhata. Did they say anything about Dhruva? There was no Dhruva for them. They had only Dhruvaka. Dhruvaka means one which has come out of Dhruva. That is the polar coordinate. They call the polar coordinate Dhruvaka and the latitude as Vikshepa. So the Dhruvaka Vikshepa is what they use in all their things. They don't use the actual yeah. as a star. There are questions whether there is a star or not. That is different. And Dhruva for the meant it is a globe. This point and this point, there are two poles actually. And that imaginary point is what was called Dhruva. So that is why the uh, Al-Baruni was mistaken that the scientific astronomers are different, the common Hindus, they have no rational approach to life. So many comments he makes. The conflict was, if at all you think there is a conflict, that kind of contradiction continues to this day in India. You see the uh, most ancient, the most modern, most important, most unimportant, they all stay together. It is the nakshatra nemi, is a word which comes in the Vishnu Sahasranama, part of Mahabharata. Some of you may know about Vishnu Sahasranama, it is a nakshatra nemi, nakshatri, etc. It is the 441st name of Vishnu. Now, Shankaracharya, in the 8th uh, century, he explains this. He explains this as Shishumara Varnane Vishnu Hradiyam. This Vish nakshatra name is Vishnu. As from the Taitiri Aranika, he is in the sky. And he also keeps Dhruva at the end. And this is the thing that we have to worship for Dhyana. And that is again, it is here. Sayana clearly says in the 14th century, Anena Mantrena Udung Mukho Bhutva Dhruva Mandalam, etc. etc. For meditation, that Taitiri Aranika is called Swadhyay Brahmana, that mantra. That means that celestial animal 
with Dhruva and with other stars was so important for this culture, starting from 3000 BC. But our scientific astronomers, what did they do? They did not support or oppose that. They made their observation. They saw that there was a new star which was coming near the pole. And that was called Dhruva Matsya, or the polar fish. And that polar fish, both Brahmagupta, Bhaskaracharya, and then in the 15th century, uh, Padmanabha, they used it for finding time in the night. And this gadget is available even today in Pune. This gadget was developed by Padmanabha in the 15th century. There is a circle here, it's a quadrant. Marks are there, there are two holes. And you have to align two stars in the two holes. The first star, Polaris, and the another bright star called Beta Ursa Minor, called Coca, and they rotate. As I showed in the first diagram, there is like a nail, it is there, the thing rotates. And you can keep on doing it from where it falls, you can find out the time from the night, evening, sunset to sunrise. This instrument is available. This obviously, no, created a lot of difficulty, psychological difficulty for people. This was sorted out in the 17th century in the Siddhanta Tattu Viveka in Banaras. I think Banaras was the central uh, you know, city for all these kinds of activities. And there he wrote his Siddhanta Tattu Viveka and he asked the question, which star to be seen by the bride? So he wrote this, Chale chale pi dhruvabe swameshad rashitrayam ta dhruvka sharastu shashashti bhagaha etc. Parinita narya mahatpalam darshanato asti. The bride should see the star which is at 66 degrees of latitude and 90 degrees of longitude. Rashitraya, that is 90 degrees. And that happens to be the present day pole star. It is going to be only this. So this is the synaptic I have put up. So this is the polar circle. And this is Draco, this is Shumara. There are 14 star, bright stars. You can count them yourself. And this polar circle here is Abhaya Dhruva because Taitiri Aranika calls it Abhayam Chaturtam. Yep. Later on, the name Dhruva came because it was fixed. So it's actually fearless. The star was fearless, and that fearlessness superposed in the Puranas on an imaginary child Dhruva. And he, with being fearless, he went to the to do the penance and all that. And Suniti is also nearby as a star. <clears throat> and you can see in between in this period of about 5,000 years, there are questions about Taitiriya Samhita, Maitrayani Aranyaka, then Shankaracharya. Marking here of the Nakshatra Nemi, then Albaruni in around 1000 BC, then almost in our period, in say 17th century, Kamala Karabatta telling, This is the star to be shown. This is the star to be shown. So that is what is done. What is the mantra used? But it's the same mantra. So the old mantra itself is used. It is in the spirit of the Vedas, it may not be in the letter of the Vedas. So, I think maybe it is time to stop, stop it here. Yeah, okay. I put up all this as a stratigraphy of Dhruva because it is the Dhruva is the backbone of Indian history. That means there are two Dhruvas. One Dhruva is this. The second Dhruva is this. This is like the two bookends. So, in this, you can have to create all history. All things have to belong to it. You may say, what happened before that? There may be something, I don't deny, Rigveda, but this is something which is fixed there. So that, that is what I have put up. In between, you can see there are so many changes which happened. This overlaps, this 3000 BC, with the Harappans. It's an important thing. Because I showed this to archaeologists, there is an overlapping period here. And the line roughly goes a 45 degree line. Both this and this are timelines actually. When you come here, it is the present day Dhruva. 
the stories are only this <laughs> taken from here they have come up like from the earth you know some new layer comes up this same stories are there but you show the new one in between there are other things like in karnataka temples in bangalore temple it's available they created a vishnu forum which is like this which is a four footed aquatic animal where in the tip dhruva is sitting this is worship particularly in the madhva sampradaya temples it is worship for the sarik gamas well um, let me see if this runs with this i can do or it doesn't run oh, i wanted to uh, juxtapose both of them and show you see the north sky today north sky 2850 bc that's what the two figures have shown today it looks like this whereas in 2850 it was looking like this so in between is the one we created an animation to show this but it's not going up now the last one is about a remark about the indologies now if this is so clear why why there is so much of problem about dating and about this conflict of aryan invasion and all those things we have to see what happened in 19th century in this country when the colonial period our own reactions were extremely limited and there are some people who would say think whatever comes from the west is wonderful and take it as it is and lap it up jacobi was a german uh, indologist he said the grihya sutras were composed in 500 bc but they show the pole star which pole star there is no pole star in 500 bc so it should be the original pole star with his argument he did not know about the taitiri aranyaka he did not know about the brahmanda purana he did not say anything on the maitrayani aranyaka and all of that this was opposed by the more influential people witney keith max muller winternet they were all opposed to any time before 1200 or 1500 bc particularly for rigveda because the, the aryans were supposed to come around that time they are supposed to bring sanskrit also into india at that time and the aryan revidi profi racial profiling was done by max muller as all of you know so they passed such caustic remarks there are printed books and unfortunately that religion and philosophy of the veda and upanishads by he published by the harvard world in series he studied as a textbook in this country even to this day and he is the man who says he initially he said it is a primitive in indian wedding ritual etc etc then he adds a footnote the poles of dhruva appears in the grihya sutras only obviously he had no idea of the other things now this is something which is extremely relevant for us and we have to be careful about well this is about the vidya gargya i will skip it here. okay thank you sir i think ஹலோ ப்ரொஃபஸர் இட் வாஸ் ஆனர் ஃபார் அஸ் டு ஆக்சுவலி லிசன் ஃப்ரம் யூ ப்ரொஃபஸர் மாதவன் ஹேட் செட் அ சம் ஸ்டேஜ் இன் த ப்ரீவியஸ் டூ கிளாஸஸ் வித் ரெஸ்பெக்ட் டு வாஸ்ட்ரோனமி இன் த வெரி டைம்ஸ் இன் எவ்ரி திங் அண்ட் டுடே வாஸ் uh it was uh, exceptionally eye opening in the sense that uh, what we study as um, uh, modern science in the modern sky may not have been the same as in the ancient times and because of that there would have been too many differences and uh, one of the main things that i really uh, liked in your presentation today is that uh, uh, once lifetime cannot um, you know tell all these things but it's the tradition and uh, in some way uh, i guess you pointed out the importance of tradition and knowing all these things to actually um, uh, uh, have a knowledge of what even uh, astronomy and uh, uh, our our history uh, so th uh, thanks a lot it has been an honor for us to actually uh, have this lecture from you thank you, thank you.
Tradition is the idea. Okay. Oh, you want to give something? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? They are asked that by the depth of what you have done. <laughs> technical details, it's difficult for okay. anybody to ask questions, I think. Thank you very much, uh, for, for having come here. Thank you. Thank you.